Last up, last but certainly not least, the anchor of this program, Dr. Mark McLaughlin. I just did a great Meeting of the Minds episode with him on our YouTube, on our Instagram page. It was excellent. He's a brain surgeon. He's the author of right here, Cognitive Dominance. Excellent stuff. Former wrestler. He worked with uh, West Point, many places. He's a great guy, and he's brought a lot of information to the table and a lot of joy and enthusiasm to the sport. So we're happy to have him. Dr. Mark, thanks for joining us. Great to be here. Super honored to be the anchor man. And I want to throw this out, Gene. If whoever has spent the entire day on this program, all 12 sessions, we're on the honor system here, but whoever has, you email Jake your address, and I'm going to send you a complimentary book because I'm so impressed with this program. I, I tuned in in the morning. I had to do a couple cases, but I heard Coach Ryan. I heard Pete Jacobson. It was great to hear Coach Goodell. It's just a phenomenal program. And anybody that can, uh, can stick with it the whole time and just saw every lecture, I'm happy to give you a copy of my book. You earned it today. I'm going to stick to my title and try to stay true to uh, really what I want to talk about tonight. And that is the title, Blind Spots, Focusing on Limitations to release your greatest gift. So first, what's your greatest gift? What's your, what is the greatest thing that you could give somebody? Um, it's, it's your love of the sport. It's your love of passing it on to another person so that they can continue to grow our sport and, and, and learn the lessons that you learned, right? What about releasing it? What, what gets in the way of releasing your gift? We all have limitations. Um, and if we can recognize those limitations, uh, we, can, we can limit them, we can decrease them, we can improve them so that we can release our gift better. And the majority, I believe, mo the majority of our limitations are based upon blind spots. Um, so I'm gonna start with a quote. If you don't realize you can't see, hear, and feel everything, then you can't begin to see the world in a different way, okay? So my overarching goal tonight is to help you get to know your weaknesses better, to recognize your blind spots and to think differently about them, to be comfortable getting involved and in looking at what your weaknesses are to focus on them. We all like to avoid our weaknesses, right? If you're not good on bottom, you're like, you wanna, you wanna, you want, you wanna be on top. You know, if you love being on feet, you love it when you're in the practice room and they're calling you, you know, to, to be neutral. But we gotta work on our weaknesses. And I wanna start with an exercise. I want everybody, if you, if you have it, get a five by seven index card in front of you. If you don't have an index card, get a piece of paper. And on the left side, I want you to put today's date, and I want you to rank what you believe your coachability is. What number on a scale of one to 10, how coachable are you? And then I want you to put uh, a one, two, three in the middle of that card. And on the other side, I want you to put the date seven, 16, 21. And I want, to put, I want you to put a question mark. Now, in the middle, put two, three numbers, one, two, three. Those are the three things that I want you to take away from this at the end of the day and really write down how you're going to work on these things. And um, if, you, if you ranked yourself 10 in coachability right now, then you probably ought to just pack it in and go have a beer, you know, because um, I think that's kind of something that probably isn't a good idea. That's probably a weakness right there if you wrote down a 10 because we can always improve, as, as, uh, as Gene said, we can always improve. So how do we improve on our coachability? Well, the first thing is to understand what blind spots are. And you know, blind spots in medicine, we call them a scotoma. A scotoma is uh, it's an area of your vision that you don't see and you're not conscious of seeing it. So in your eye, uh, it's sort of like two cups looking out, taking in all the light from the environment. And, um, and the cones and the rods, the cells in your retina that pick up the light and pick up the color, they all send arms out called axons, which go into the optic nerve. And all these nerves co coalesce in the optic nerve in one single nerve that goes back to your brain. And at that spot in your retina, there are no nerve cells. There are no cones, no rods, and you cannot see anything. And so many of you have probably done that little test where you have the the square on one side and the triangle on one side, and you close your eye and you see this spot. 
Well, that spot is a physical scotoma, right? It's important for you to know that. But there are other scotomas. We can't, he we can't see everything that's out there. In fact, think about this, all right? The human eye can only pick up 400 to 700 nanometers of electromagnetic radiation. We see that in the form of light. But we are being rained down upon by gamma rays, by radio waves, by a, a billion other types of, of electromagnetic magnetic radiation that's coming our way that we do not see. In fact, if you take the visual spectrum or the spectrum of electromagnetic light and you just put human vision on it, which is 400 to 700 nanometers, it's not even a slice on a yardstick. It's, it's an infinitesimal line on a yardstick. And, you know, bats, you know, they, 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 they can see, they, they use echolocution to see. Um, so we don't see everything that's in our environment. Furthermore, we don't hear everything that's in our environment. Okay, I mean, dogs know this. Human hearing is only between 200 and 20,000 hertz. So dogs and animals, they can hear things that we don't hear, right? There's things out there that you can't hear. And there's things out there that you can't feel either. I mean, there, we, we feel electricity when we touch our finger on an electrical socket, right? But, um, but there are fish and eels and, and other animals that have skin that senses electromagnetic waves and, and, and ele electricity. They live in a galvanic world and they hunt by that gal galvanic world and they travel by that galvanic world. So there are all kinds of forces out there that we don't sense. But over time, science has helped us to develop instruments that can pick those things up. We can hear bats echolocution. We can actually retransmit re the sounds that they're making and we can communicate the same way bats do, or we can sense electricity, or we can take electromagnetic waves and we can see diversions in them. And with that, we can look down at the, at, at the size of an atom. We can break our vision down and actually see an atom in an electron microscope. Or we can look in a telescope and we can see electromagnetic changes and we can see the farthest, most distant stars in the sky and we can learn things. And as a coach, you have to understand that you have to develop those instruments so that you can see hear and feel better. You can feel more. If you want to be a better coach, that's what you need to set your goals on. So I want to share with you a couple stories that helped me learn how to see, hear, and feel better. First, seeing. I'm in the middle of a craniotomy. I'm actually working on, um, working on a patient that has a colloid cyst. A colloid cyst is a, a small benign um, cyst. It's a little, little pocket of proteinaceous fluid that sits in the center of the brain. Sometimes it grows and it ca can cause pressure on your memory apparatus. So this is a 36-year-old man who I'm working on who's came in with trouble with memory and headaches. And I'm in the middle of his operation. I've parted his frontal lobes. I've got two little um, retractors which look like emery boards and they've parted the brain tissue and it's helped me get a corridor down to come down onto this tumor. And I wheel the microscope in. Um, the microscope comes down, I focus down into the area and I'm looking right down on the spot where the tumor should, should be. And I don't see a tumor. All I see is normal brain tissue. I look forward, I look backward, I look to the side, I look to the other side. All I'm seeing is normal brain structures. Hmm, kind of uneasy. I sit back, what could be going on here? Um, I got this guy on the table here and I can't find his tumor. So I go back to his scan and I look at it and sure enough, there it is. I ask myself some questions. Is there any chance that this could have disappeared since this scan? Very unlikely, this scan was done two days ago. Could I have punctured the cyst while I was coming down on it? No, that's very unlikely because I went down very, very slowly and carefully and uh, puncturing it certainly is a possibility, but it would have been very unlikely. Uh, <laughs> am I operating on the right person? Yes, you're operating on the right person. Am I on the right side of the head? Yes. You're on the correct side of the head. 
So now I start to begin to get really nervous. What's going on here? I step away from the uh, operating field. I pick up, uh, have the nurse pick up the phone for me and I dial one of my partners. It's late, at, late in the afternoon, everybody's gone away. And my partner, I get him on the phone and say, hey, listen, I need you to come in and help me out here. I'm, I'm a little bit lost and I can't, can't find what I'm looking for. Um, and he tells me he's not available, can't, can't help me. Tells me to put a shunt in, which is a solution because it would deep bypass the fluid, but it wouldn't treat the tumor and it wouldn't improve this guy's memory. So it's a bad, bad option, an option, but not a good option. So nurse hangs up the phone. I'm standing there with my arms folded and I, I don't know what to do. So what I do is I identify that. I say to the room, you know what? We're gonna take this really slowly. Let's get back in, get the microscope in. I'm gonna start from the top here. We're gonna go layer by layer, position by position, step by step, all the way down here. And we're gonna see what we can do. So I begin to narrate the situation. Um, here's the scalp, here's the subcutaneous tissue, here's the skull. I've gone through the skull, here's the frontal lobe. Okay, I'm following down the frontal lobe. Okay, now I see the landmark vein, the thalamus right vein. And I'm coming down right to where I need to be, and this is where the tumor should be. I've got my scrub nurse on my side, I've got my circulator, they're watching on the monitor. And the confidence of just narrating that, of just talking through it, of admitting that I didn't see everything, helped me be just a little bit more aggressive and spread those little emery board malleable retractors a little bit more. And then all of a sudden, I came down upon this filmy tissue and I saw exactly what I needed to see. It just was twice as small as I expected it to be. I had operated on tumors like this before, but in my mind's eye, I was used to the big tumors and not this smaller one. I came down on it, I identified it, I surrounded it, I took it out, and I went home. Later on that night, we closed, went home, and finished the case. And I walked out of that hospital as a young surgeon early on in my career, and I said, you can solve these problems. You, can, you anticipated something big, and it wasn't big. You need to think more about your mind's eye and how you can get there. But going through that exercise and, and successfully removing that cyst after that struggle, after hearing that I had nobody to help me, I walked out of that place a much, much better surgeon. So I could see more. So when you see more, if you can admit humility, admit you don't have all the solutions, you'll see more. Sight, very important to being a great coach. Next is hearing. This is now 15 years later. I'm a seasoned surgeon. I've been out in practice for a long time. I'm in my idling Acura, getting ready to get psyched up for a difficult case. It's another craniotomy on a tumor. And I'm trying to get my uh, confidence level up before I go in the hospital. I gotta put on my brain surgeon mask, which is an unflappable, totally confident, reassuring face for a family that I need to talk to about a tumor. It's 2.30 in the afternoon. The surgery has been delayed a couple of hours by some other problems that happened at the hospital. It's not a great time. 2.30 is a tough time in the OR because shift change is at three. So the nurses that set up your operating table are usually not likely the nurses that are gonna be helping you during the surgery. They're gonna turn over. So when you're in the middle of an operation and you ask for a certain instrument, there's a million instruments on the table. And it's kind of like a where's Waldo. They're not familiar with it. They didn't set the table. So these are delays that can disrupt surgical flow. Specifically with a, with a, a scrub nurse, surgery is a lot like dancing. You gotta know your partner and you gotta have everything laid out. 
hands-on to get surgical rhythm. When you get surgical rhythm, you get your mojo, and you get things going. So it's 2.30. I know there's going to be a shift change. And it's a case that I don't normally do. It's a case I've done plenty of, many, but um, over the last few years, I've handed them over to one of my partners who's a, really a tumor specialist and a great surgeon. But he's out of town this week, and, you know, I've got to get the, the case done. It's something I've done. I know how to do, but I haven't done in a while. So it's stressing me out a little bit. It's also Friday. I'm exhausted. I've already had an 80-hour work week, done five other surgeries, seen dozens of patients, got a dozen phone calls that day to catch up with, with uh, all the things that were going on. So I'm trying to get myself psyched up and I'm about ready to step out of my car and a little bubble pops up on my phone. You've got voicemail. It's from my father's physician. And my dad had not been feeling well that week and I knew he was going to the doctor. So then I'm in this dilemma. Do I call my dad's physician and find out what's going on or do I leave it for later after this case? But by the time I finish the case, it's going to be nine or 10 o'clock at night. And, um, you know, he may be one of those doctors that doesn't answer his phone over the weekend. He's not on call. He might not answer. So I decided I better answer, better answer this call. So I, I called the doctor back and uh, he delivers the news to me that my father has AML, uh, acute myelogenous leukemia, which is really a death sentence for an 88 year old man. So here I am in my car, trying to get myself ready. I'm tired. I got a hard case, something I don't usually do. And I just got this news. And in my mind, I'm like, oh my God, like, what did you just do? Like, you just took yourself out of the game here. And you, you can't do this case. Like, you, you're, you got to go up and see your dad. I mean, he just heard, he just heard his diagnosis. I decide, you know, what do you want to do? You want to cancel the case? Well, it's, it's not a good case to cancel because the patient's tumor is a, it's a, it's a tumor that could, could bleed or he could get swelling at nighttime and he could become very sick. So it's not something that would be a very good idea to delay. I decided to go in, I'm, I'm going to go in and I'm going to see this patient and I'm going to see his family and I'm going to see what it feels like. I'm going to see how I feel see if I can get my mojo going. And if I really, really don't feel like I'm up for it, I'll cancel it. But I gotta kinda see where I'm at. So I go in the hospital and I go get a cup of coffee and I start walking through the hallways, go into the locker room. I put on my scrubs, which is my uniform these days. I walk into the hallowed ground, the operating room, the operating theater, all, everything's laid out. And I start getting I start feeling a little better, I start moving. I drink this coffee and I go see the family. And there he is, this patient's in the bedside and he's ready to go and his wife and his two daughters are at his bedside. And I'm like, gosh, I'm like, this guy needs me, you know? But how are you gonna get through this? How, how are you gonna do it? You, you got a terrible distraction on your mind. Can you do it? Can you do this? And then I, I heard, I heard, the voice of my dad in my head. I, I, heard, I heard a poem that he had given me a long time ago. It's Rudyard Kipling's poem. And I heard the, stan, the stanzas of Rudyard Kipling's poem. I don't, know if you've, I don't know if you've heard it, but I want to read a couple stanzas to you because these are what came to my mind. If you can fill the unforgiving minute with 60 seconds worth of distance run, if you can force your heart and nerve and sinew to serve your turn long after they are gone. If you can meet with triumph and disaster and treat those two imposters just the same. This is, this, I love this poem. This is my favorite poem of all times. And um, I love it because, and I say this when I give my talks up at West Point is, you know, performance enhancement literature Poetry was the world's first performance enhancement literature. Look at it. Read Ulysses. See these lines. This is perfect. If you can meet with triumph and disaster and treat those two imposters just the same. Those words stand over the, 
over the transom of the entrance to the Wimbledon Center Court. It really, really is truly some of the best advice you could ever get before you're about to compete. Don't think about winning or losing. Those are distractions. They're not in the present moment. They're in the past, they're in the future. When I'm operating and I'm using instruments like a kerosin rondeur, which kind of looks like a long gun, when I squeeze it, it closes. It closes on bone. And I gotta be careful every time I squeeze that instrument, if it closes on a piece of nerve tissue, I've changed somebody's life forever. I've gotta pay attention. I could do 500 kerosene bites in one surgery, and I've gotta pay attention to the one that I'm doing. Not the one before, not the one that's coming up, but the one that I'm doing. Because if I start thinking about who this patient is, maybe it's a celebrity and how they're gonna do afterwards, or I start thinking, oh my gosh, what happens if I pull on something and damage a nerve root? That's, that's not in the present moment. That's the distraction. So those words came to me, that poem came to me. And I came to the conclusion, one thing, what would my dad want me to do? Would he want me to go see him right now? Or would he want me to do my job? Would he want me to do exactly what I was put on earth here to do? And what I came to the final decision was, I'm not gonna cancel this case. I'm gonna dedicate this case to my father what he means to me. Went ahead and did the case and it went beautifully. It was one of the best cases I ever did. So I, I heard, I heard something. I heard something from literature that helped me be a better surgeon. And I find it no coincidence whatsoever that Tom Ryan earlier today was reading literature as well. He was reading literature from what, as a man thinketh. And um, if you want to be a better coach, you've got to peruse the literature. You've got to read things and push yourselves in areas that, that will make you a better coach. Reading poetry, reading literature, and passing it on to your wrestlers and your parents and your administrators and the people you work with is something that's going to make you a better coach. So I want to finish with the last thing that I think can help you become a better coach. And that is feel, feel and know exactly what your purpose is here. So the story goes like this. Jesus Rodriguez, Jesus Rodriguez is a patient that I took care of early on, early on in my surgical career. And what happened was I met him on a summer night in August, my first month of, of uh, practicing. And he had miscalculated. He had dove into a swimming pool and he immediately went paralyzed. And his son jumped in the pool and rescued him and surfaced him, helped him surface. And as he was gasping for air, he said, I can't move my arms and legs. I, I can't feel anything. So EMS brought him to my emergency room and I met him in the hospital. He had a he had a severe spinal cord injury, a fractured dislocation of C4 on C5. And his chances for recovery were very poor, probably one in 500 or even greater. I took him to the operating room. I reduced his fracture. I stabilized his spine. And I took him to the ICU that, that night. And miraculously, over two to three days, he began wiggling his fingers a little bit. He began wiggling his toes. Over the course of two weeks, he actually got up and was able to walk out of the hospital. In fact, there was a picture on the town newspaper in Springfield, Massachusetts, before I moved to New Jersey. It was a picture on the cover with me and Jesus. And I got a copy of it, landed on my desk from one of my neurology colleagues, and he wrote across the top in big Sharpie, what's this, McLaughlin saves Jesus? <laughs> so. I wrote back under it, I said, never underestimate the arrogance of a neurosurgeon, and I left it on his desk. Jesus was a very lucky man, and I was a very lucky young surgeon. Several weeks later, a young boy came to my emergency room. His name is Anthony LaCory, and he was this magnetic eight-year-old kid who uh, had fallen off a school bus, and he had cut his head. 
and he just had this really neat personality. He was a, had a great humor to him, and he was just a beautiful kid. But his mom and dad were at his bedside, and they said, Doctor, my, our son's not, he's not acting right. He's been stumbling and falling. He's been sleeping a lot. We have a pizza parlor down the street, and he busts his tables. He's my number one helper, but he's been, he's been dropping things. He's not right. Quick MRI scan showed that Anthony had uh, a brain tumor pressing on his brain stem, deep in his brain, the back of the brain near the cerebellum. I had all the training, eight years of residency. I had done pediatric training with some of the best pediatric neurosurgeons. I had all the skills to take care of him, and I was confident I could fix this problem. I took him to the operating room 24 hours later, and I put him in position, in a prone position with his head down. I made an incision in the back of his head, and I opened the skull and came down on a very angry-looking bluish vascular tumor. I started surrounding it. I retracted the brain tissue. I got around the tumor. I began debulking it. I had to take the blood supply. You have to surround the enemy when you're operating. So you take the blood supply around it so you don't lose too much blood. And then you get in the middle of the tumor and you gut it. You, you scoop it out almost like a, a melon ball, you know, a little micro melon ball or under the microscope. You scoop it out so that it collapses on itself and then you can surround it more. You put some patties around it so you protect the walls of the normal brain tissue. And I worked on this thing for five hours and I shaved it right off his brainstem. Every little cell, as careful as I could with one of my partners who helped me. We shaved that brain tumor off, and we took him to the ICU, ICU later that night. His operation went perfectly, and he woke up perfectly. He was moving everything. He was talking. He was smiling, and I saw that beautiful boy that I saw in the emergency room, and I walked out of that ICU that night, and I, I was on top of the world. It's like, man, this is awesome. This is what it's like to be a brain surgeon. I feel great. Then I got a phone call the next morning. Hey, doctor, Anthony's not acting right. He stopped talking and he shrieks whenever we touch him. I jump in my car. I go see Anthony. Sure enough, he's acting very strangely. He's not talking to me. When I move his arm or his leg, he just looks at me with this awful look and he shrieks as if I'm poking him with a hot poker. I take him down for a scan. The scan looks pristine. The tumor's all gone. His brainstem looks healthy. It's, it looks like a perfect resection. I take him back to the ICU. I talk to his parents. You know, there's, there's, this, there's this complication with pediatric tumors, I tell his parents, called cerebellar mutism. It's this uh, rare um, complication that we have where children, they lose their speech and they become hypersensitive and, and really apathetic. They won't move in bed. They just kind of become a couch potato. But it usually re recovers over a couple of weeks or months, and it's usually, it's, it's not permanent. I tell Mr. and Mrs. LaCorey. They're looking at me. They, 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 they're worried. They're nervous. Anthony, you can see in his eyes, knows something's wrong, but he, he can't express it. So we wait a few days and uh, in the hopes that things get better. But things don't get better. He gets worse. His mutism gets worse. His shrieking gets worse. We have to move him to a private room because he's, he's upsetting all the nurses and all the other patients in the ICU. So we've got him in a private room. And uh, he begins to develop a fluid buildup on his brain, something called hydrocephalus, which is another complication from pediatric brain tumors. So I talk to his parents. I tell them this is a complication that sometimes happens and we have to put a tubing in to bypass the fluid so that Anthony's fluid won't build up and won't press on his brain. So we put the shunt in and a couple more days go by and Anthony's not better. He's worse again. In fact, his pathology comes back malignant tumor. Not good. Not good. Then his shunt clogs and I have to take him back to the operating room and unclog it. Then a couple days later, he gets a wound infection. 
and we have to take them back to the operating room and repair it and wash it out again. Anthony stayed in the ICU for three months. And he, he suffered and his parents suffered. I, I didn't know what to do. I, I, I thought I did everything right. I, I did his surgery perfectly and I took as best care as I could, but no matter what happened, all I could do is see this little beautiful boy slipping through my fingers getting neurological insult after neurological insult after neurological insult and not being the same that he was before the surgery. Well, Anthony, he, um, he ultimately stabilized. And as he got ready to be transferred out to rehab and then ultimately to go get his chemotherapy and his radiation therapy, his mom and dad, they asked me to get a picture with him by, the, by his bedside. And so they, they snapped this picture uh, that I have here. I'm trying to show it up to the screen here. You can see a young, a young me and a young Anthony. And, um, but I got to tell you, as I sat, as I stood by his bedside and I, I was there, I faked that smile. I faked it because I knew in my heart there was nothing good coming to this kid. He was going to get chemotherapy, radiation therapy. He had a malignant tumor. He was never, ever, ever going to be the same. And I felt terrible about it. So he left the hospital, but he did not leave me. In fact, that was when I began taking long walks at night, asking myself, what could I have done differently? Did I, was I too, was I too uh, aggressive with retracting his brain tissue? That caused the, could that have caused the cerebellar mutism? Did I, could I have picked up the fluid buildup earlier to avoid his shunt? Or could I have picked up his infection earlier? What could I have done? What did I miss? Why, why couldn't I save this kid? Why do I feel like this? I, 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 I spent the last eight years of my life to feel like this. I feel terrible. This isn't what I wanted. What am I, what did I get myself into here? I'm miserable. And it was something that even though I was around, you know, very supportive colleagues who told me, hey, this is, these things happen and, you know, you, you, you just, you did your best and that's all you can do. And even though I was around loving family, um, I felt very, very alone. And I felt like I'd let, I'd let Anthony down and his parents down too. Well, I ended up avoiding pediatric neurosurgery. I ended up stopping pediatric neurosurgery because I couldn't tolerate, I couldn't even think of having another Anthony in my life. I, I just, I ran away from it. And um, I even moved. I moved down to New Jersey for a number of reasons, but I'm sure subconsciously one of them was to get away from the feeling that I had about Anthony and how I, I could have done better for him. And I began my practice and I began a new practice down here in New Jersey and I focused on other things and I did well. Um, but this plaque, this picture that his family gave me, I, I couldn't put it in a box. I had to hang it in my office. And every time I walked by it in my office, I felt sad and I thought about Anthony and I thought about what, what could I have done better to, to make Anthony do well. For 15 years, for 15 years, I had that on the wall. And for 15 years, I walked by it. And for 15 years, I felt bad every time I walked by it. And then I began writing this book, Cognitive Dominance, a book about tackling your fears, about conquering your fears. And I thought, God, you know, I looked at that picture and I said, what kind of a hypocrite are you? I mean, you, you basically ran away from one of your worst surgical uh, complications. And I realized I had to figure out, I had to figure out, I had to beat this demon. And so how was I going to beat this demon? So I said, I got to find out what happened to Anthony. I never, I never followed Anthony after I left New Jersey. I, um, I just went on with my practice and kind of put him in what I think a lot of surgeons do. They suppress it. And they put it in this graveyard in their mind. And they just say, I'm not going to think about that. 
and maybe they become a little more aloof or a little more distance with patients because they don't want to feel that feeling. They don't want to have that feeling as a doctor. You've probably met doctors like this. They got a little, they don't, they don't, you don't get a connection with them. So I realized I had to, uh, I had to find out what happened to Anthony. So I went on Facebook and sure enough, LaCourie's Pizza still there. In West Springfield, Massachusetts. If you're ever driving through, it's a great, great restaurant. And I looked on their Facebook page and I saw Mr. and Mrs. LaCourie and I scrolled down a little farther and then all of a sudden I saw this 24 year old man in a wheelchair next to his mom and dad at Rockefeller Center. I'm like, oh my God, Anthony's still alive. I can't believe it. I, I truly, I couldn't believe it. I thought he had passed away given all the complications he had and, and, his, and his diagnosis. So I called his parents and I said, I got to come up. I want to come up and see you. I'm, I've been thinking about you and I want, I've written this book and I, I, I want to see Anthony. So they say, sure, come up. And I drive up that weekend. I drive straight to LaCourie's Pizza and I see Mr. and Mrs. LaCourie and I see Anthony. You know, Anthony is, Anthony is debilitated. He has significant disabilities. He's in a wheelchair and has trouble with his vision, but he's still there and he's with his parents. And I sit down at the table and I talk to his parents and I say, you know, I got to tell you, I, I've carried this feeling of sadness about Anthony and how I, I wish I could have done a better job for your son. I wish I could have done more so that he, 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 he came back to you as he was when he was that little eight year old boy. And they came around the table and they gave me this gigantic hug and they said, Dr. McLaughlin, you're our hero. What are you talking about? How could you feel bad about this? You saved our boy. He's still our number one boy in this restaurant. And I was just completely blown away by that. Blown away. And they showered me, me with gifts. They gave me food to take home and they gave me a purse to take home for my wife. They had just traveled to Italy and they gave me an Italian purse to give to my wife. They gave me a plant from their restaurant that had been in that restaurant for 35 years, which I still have in my house today. And they gave me another picture. They gave me this picture. It's a picture of all the LaCouries and me and my family and Anthony, the day we left to go from Springfield to New Jersey. This was what was hanging on their wall. And I looked at it and I, I had completely forgotten about that picture. I had completely locked that out of my mind. I had told my story to myself that I was a failure, that I let Anthony and his parents down. Whereas they had a story where they got to keep their boy and he was still on earth and he was saved from a terrible, terrible disease. So when I got in my car that night, I can't tell you what an amazing feeling I had, what an amazing gratitude I had that I, that I had served them in the way that I did. And I felt this incredible feeling that even though I suffered for 15 years as well, feeling bad, I would never trade that for a million, world, million years because of the privilege it was to take care of this boy and his family. And I called my editor that night on the way home and I said, I, I got the end of Anthony's story. I, I finally... I finally went up and figured out this whole story and I want to put it in the book. And my editors that said, my Sean said, that's great. That's phenomenal. We're going to put that story and we're going to juxtapose it right next to Jesus. And I was like, really? Like I, that doesn't make any sense to me, Sean. Why would you put in like this amazing success story and this, this story of this boy not, not doing well after his surgery. And he says, Mark, you, you don't, he says to me, Mark, you don't see it, do you? I'm like, no, I don't see it. He goes, Mark, you take a person who's paralyzed and you make them walk again and you say it's luck. And you take a boy who has a malignant tumor and you save his life, but he doesn't do well and you say it's your fault. That is an impossible, impossible standard to live up to. And on that day, realizing and feeling those feelings, I became 
a much, much better surgeon, a much, much better surgeon because I, it was a blind spot for me. I didn't feel the right thing. I had told myself the wrong story. I think it's, again, it's, it's no coincidence. And I've always said this, that if you want to become great, you've got to have partnerships. You can't become great on your own. Coach Goodale talked to, Goodall talked about this too. You need partnerships. I, I find it no coincidence that Lee Janes used his mindset. She's reaching out to get help. This is a world medalist who needs help. We all need help in certain areas to help us see our blind spots. So it's really, really important for you to remember that the talking to other people and getting different perspectives will help you realize what your purpose is on earth, what your purpose is as a coach. For me, on that day, it reinforced more than ever that my purpose is not to cure everybody. My purpose is to ease suffering and be of service to people. That was the lesson that I learned. So I'll conclude with saying we all have blind spots. We all have areas that we don't see, we don't hear, we don't feel. And if we can reach out to people around us and form partnerships, we can, we can learn where those areas are and we can get stronger. So I want to I wanna just give you one more blind spot that I realized, and I, and I want all wrestling coaches to realize this is a really important one. And that is that the wrestling mindset itself sometimes can be a blind spot, okay? And this is why it can be a blind spot. You need to be aware of it. And that is a wrestling mindset is imposing your will on somebody. Right? When you get on the mat, your job is to impose your will on that person. And that serves you really well in certain things. It serves you, serves you really well in a crisis. It serves you really well when you need to suffer. That's why I think wrestlers are doing great in this COVID crisis, because we're used to suffering. The American people in general aren't used to it, but we're used to it. So we're thriving on it. But it, it teaches you to suffer, and that's a great thing. But remember, Imposing your will does not work in certain situations. It doesn't work in partnerships. It doesn't work in friendships. It doesn't work in marriage. Any of you who are married out there, imposing your will on your spouse does not work. Okay? And it doesn't help you in negotiations either. You need to approach those things with a sense of service and being on the same team. So when you're walking into an administrator's office, I would suggest that you consider checking your wrestling mindset at the door because they are a different animal and they're looking for cooperation and collaboration. And that can help you if you know that that's one of your blind spots. If you're getting in, you know, trying to build a relationship and coach Goodall talked about this with his wrestlers, you got to know everything about them. You got to know their brothers and sisters. You got to know everything about them and how they tick. Cause if you do, then you'll know what motivates them and you can enroll them in your program better. And when you're talking to parents, know what a parent's mindset is. A parent's mindset is, am I going to let my most prized possession spend time with you? Am I going to let my, the thing that I would die for, am I going to let that child hang around you? That's the question a parent has in their mind. And if you're serving if you're serving your parent, if you're serving your wrestlers, and if you're serving your administrators, you are going to better release your gift, you're gonna overcome your limitations, and you're gonna, you're gonna grow the team that you want, and you're gonna grow into be the person that you want. So again, I wanna finish with, ask yourself, how can I get better? How can I release my gift better? How can I minimize my blind spots? And are you going to feed your wrestlers poetry, literature, science? Take that index card and write down tonight three things that you're going to work on that's going to help you raise your level of coachability in the next year. Decide what they are, put it on that card, and tape it to your computer or carry it in your wallet 
and work on it and share with your assistant coaches and share this because it's truly important for us to know where blind spots are and how we can overcome them. Thank you. Mark, great stuff. Really good. Tons of great information there. Great stories. I mean, you really feel like you're in there in the ER with you. So that's nuts. And, and again, just being able to share that such unique angle that no one else is able to bring to it. I mean, literally, no one has that kind of experience. We talk about being under pressure because, oh, we're a heavy favorite and what happens if I lose? I mean, forget about it. Mistakes, mistakes in your field are, are deadly. So it's, it's great. I mean, everything that you brought to us is great. And we thank you for all the work you do. So talk about what, are, what would you say, just to throw a few questions in there, Biggest difference is mentally now, mentally and emotionally preparing wrestling versus before a surgery. Just to shake it up because the audience are wrestlers and everyone. I would say there's, there's really no difference. I mean, when I get in the operating room, I'm moving around, I'm moving my arms, I'm moving my legs, I'm getting myself ready. I'm listening to some psych music, which I enjoy. I love country music. It inspires me. I love, uh, you know, so I have a certain song list that I listen to. I, you know, again, I put on a uniform, I walk into a hallowed ground and I have to perform. Um, I think the one difference is flow is different in the operating room. You cannot just let your body uh, do everything without thinking because there's lions and tigers at every corner. So there are segments of surgery that you can get into a fugue where you're actually just doing it and, you know, time stands still and you just do what you need to. Um, but my experience is that you always need to be thinking of what other things could happen and you need to have your fire drill of if that happens, what am I going to do? A, B, C, D, E, F, or G. So, um, so those are the kinds of things I'm thinking about in the operating room. Excellent. Excellent. And then where do we send people? That's a big thing we need to talk about. Where do we send people to get the book? Everyone on this call, and we've said this before, I want everyone on this call getting the book. So it's great. Tell us. Absolutely. Absolutely. So um, the book is available on Amazon. Uh, you can get it through B Amazon. Black Irish Books has a, a number of great books. Uh, Steve Pressfield, uh, the, the War of Art, um, The Legend of Bagger Vance, all those books are on Black Irish, so you can get it at Black Irish as well. Um, my website, markmclaughlinmd.com. I have a blog. Um, I, I love talking about coaching, and I uh, have a number of other talks that I've given on um, uh, lifestyles that will uh, help longevity and uh, building your platform. So I, I'd love to share that, that information. Um, so I, that, those would be the two best places. I love feedback. I wanna make this talk better. I wanna give it to as many people as possible. So I'd love your feedback. Like I said, anybody that's, uh, that's attended every single one of these talks, I wanna give them a book as my present to them. And um, just, uh, just uh, share it. I appreciate very much if you have read it, if you have read the book and you, and, you, uh, and you think it's worthy, please go on Amazon and give it a rating uh, and a review because, you know, in, in order to get over the noise, it's really important to have a number of reviews out there. And, um, and I do believe it's, it's not a book for everybody. It's a deep book. You need to do some work. If you want to get better in this area, you need to do some work. But if you're committed to doing the work, I do, I truly think that it could, it could change your attitude and how you and how you approach things and help you in uh, in situations in your life in in, in business and family and in coaching and in work. Absolutely, couldn't end that on a better note because that is exactly what we're all about with the wrestling mindset. That this applies whether we're talking about in school, in a championship wrestling match, in a wrestle off, taking the SATs or ACTs, saying no to drugs or peer pressure in the middle of a, of a surgery. It is all about having that winning mindset that starts from wrestling. That's knowing what works for you. That's understanding what to focus on versus what not to focus on. Um, how to relax under pressure, how to stay in the present moment, how to be confident. And again, just all of that, just being clear. I mean, uh, Matt Brown spoke about that, the immortal Matt Brown, about just that clarity when you're out there. As you're saying, you have those procedures to A, B, C, and D. You're, re you're ready to go. And the best wrestlers, they have that plan too. So that was, 
That was phenomenal. Thank you very much, Dr. Mark. And, and way to go anchoring, anchoring it down, the presentation, the whole, the whole thing. We ended it with you. My pleasure. Thank you for the opportunity. Keep up the great work. Can I get one last thing in here real quick? Uh, you said you listen to country music. Who are some of your favorite uh, uh, artists? Well, I love John Hyatt, who's actually sort of a country blues singer. He's wonderful. He has a song called Through Your Hands, which is just a really, really inspiring song for me. Um, you know, it just talks about how through your hands you can change things. And he just, it's just a beautiful, beautiful song. Um, and then I love, I love like the modern country stuff. Russell Dickerson, uh, Dustin Lynch, Tim McGraw. Tim McGraw is a great, inspiring guy. He's got a wonderful book out too. If you haven't read it, Grit and Grace, that's a great book to read. Um, uh, got me, got me fired up. Uh, and that guy's a fitness fanatic. So uh, I, lo I love, I love modern country generally. And I like the old stuff too. George Strait, you know, Charlie Pride. So I got to have my country music going in the morning. And then in the afternoon, I'll let the OR staff listen to what they want to listen to. Yeah, I'm, I'm probably the only country music fan on the, uh, the core mindset team. But uh, I appreciate, appreciate that we got that in common. Thanks so much for coming on. Absolutely. Excellent. Thank you very much, Dr. Mark. We appreciate it. And we appreciate all of you for joining us 